What's your favorite book of the Bible? Do you have a favorite book? Well, I've always drawn to the Gospel of John. I resonated to John being with Jesus, but my dad was a book of Revelation. And I wondered why he liked Revelation. There are monsters and beasts and numbers and dragons and all kinds of things. And angels singing holy, holy, holy and, and seraphim and, you know, um, it's a bookend of the Bible. We start off in Genesis, we end up in Revelation and we have to ask certain questions. I just want to give an introduction today to whet our appetites where the Spirit says multiple times in the words of Jesus, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to give us some keys to unlocking this mysterious apocalyptical book written in a most strange style. And so, you know, rather than being intimidated by it, we can begin to ask some really fundamental questions like, who wrote it? And how did it come into existence? And how was it acknowledged as part of the canon of the scripture? And, and yeah, okay, we know that John of Patmos, probably the Apostle John, Jesus gave it, um, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place, Revelation 1.1. But what about the people who received it? How did they understand it when it comes to new numbers and images? And the big question that we have to ask is how do we understand it? Do you read from it? Um, and, what, and the question that we can ask is, what is the takeaway for you and me? Like, so what? It's going to happen anyway. How is it going to affect me? The so what factor is very, very important. I want you to imagine a river, and there's two towns on each side of the river, and they're separated by this river, and there's a bridge across there. But the town on the other side of the river is a 1,000 years old. So you're travelling across time and space and distance. And the theologian, the Bible reader, is you're in your town and you're looking at another town and you want to cross the river. Now some parts of the river are very narrow and very shallow and you can walk straight across, barely getting wet. But some parts of the river flow very deep, a bit scary, and you need a bridge to cross it. And what we've got to do is understand your perspective in 2024 and what the times and the language and the culture and the the nuances of a civilization that lived three and a half thousand years ago or 2,000 years ago. And one of the challenges we have when we read scripture, we are thousands of years apart from the original text. And times were different. You know, for example, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And so you think, what's the big deal with 40? Well, 40 is always a time of trial and testing. Ah, so you understand it's got some extra meaning. Now, when I read the Message Bible, it says it rained cats and dogs. Now, people a thousand years ago, if we wrote down it rained cats and dogs, they were thinking, well, what happened in 2024? Like, did dogs and cats come from the sky? No, it's a saying. And so our language where we are today and where they were thousands of years ago, cultures move and change. And... and we are in our town in 2024, but we are looking at a text given in the first century, almost 2,000 years ago. The question is, how do we cross that bridge authentically and how do we correctly understand the prescriptive that simply talks to us and gives us an action, so what? Change your life, you must do this, you must... Or the descriptive that exists in the past. A descriptive nature is Peter walked in water. Is that a compulsion for us today to go and walk in water? Say, so Jesus, if it's you, I'm full of faith. No, but what you take away from it is Peter had the courage and the strength to bid Jesus and to step out in faith. So what's your scary, watery, stormy space that you're going to step in? So there are takeaways. Today we're going to look as introductory to the book of Revelation and I'm going to answer a couple of questions why is it in the Bible? What did it mean in the first century? Because it was meant to be read, heard and kept. Read, heard and kept. Why might revelation be important? And what does it mean for us today? And not only why was it intended for an early audience, but what's it meant for us? 
Now, there are many pastors and theologians who've wrestled with, with um, the book of Revelation. In fact, one pastor said, a very sincere man, he said, I never preach from the book of Revelation. Another pastor said, a well-known author as well, this was John's multidimensional worship on a Sunday morning, speaking of victory over evil. Okay, was it his Sunday morning worship? You know, um, there are friends of mine who spend countless hours trying to interpret the numerology. 1,320, 144,000. The meaning of the seven, why seven is there. Um, um, 24 elders. Um, there's a lot of numerology, numbers that have meaning. The beast, the, the beast is 666. And you go, whoa, you know, and there's a lot of people spend a lot of time interpreting. Um, others spend a lot of time trying to work out how far away we are from all that's prophesied. Is the tribulation three and a half years? Is the tribulation seven years? And one, one man I know said, if you don't understand the three and a half to seven years, you've missed out on salvation. I'm going, what? What? I think oh, we've all missed out. Now, if you give a bit of a background, I grew up in a Sabbath church and I spent a lot of time growing up in the book of Revelation, partly because my dad's interested and partly because our church, because I wanted to join the dots. I wanted to understand it and, and to understand prophecy, I felt there was a need to understand it. Now, one of the things about prophecy is I've come to understand I don't need to worry about trying to interpret all the symbols in there as to what they mean. Because when that happens, we'll understand. I'll give you an example. In Isaiah, we have an example where Isaiah is given a powerful word from God, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And Matthew quotes from that. But can I ask you, what did Isaiah do with that? Virgins don't conceive unless she's no longer... Okay, what do we do with that? But when it happened, the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and she conceived the Son of God in Bethlehem of the household of David of the tribe of Judah, everybody goes, that ticks the box. box. And all the wise men came from the east to worship Jesus. And so... So we understand that if we live through it, or our children or our grandchildren, and I pray the kingdom of God, the coming of Christ is sooner than later, then, um, then I pray that we see it understood. Because I believe that Revelation is meant to be understood. It's dramatic, it's sensory, and it's futuristic. And it's designed to have a powerful impact on us. And it was given by Jesus to John... And if you read chapter 1, and we won't today, it gives a vivid description of the glorified Jesus. Now, Peter, John and James saw Jesus transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, shining brighter than the sun. But John now, in vision, sees Jesus glorified, and he gives a description. And, um, and then in, in chapter... Now, what are we are going to do? We're going to look a little bit at chapter 1, but then we're going to do a spoiler alert and go to chapter 22, the end of the Revelation. Because chapter 1 and chapter... 22 say some of the same things. Very interesting. In chapter 22, now I don't have the scriptures on the screen today, so you get, we're not going to turn much more beyond out of Revelation today. In chapter 22, verse 10, he said to me, right at the very end, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Okay, well, we can ask the question, well, how near is 2,000 years ago? That's a very good question. In other words, the surprise element of Jesus coming. Now, I want to contrast this with the scripture in Daniel because revelation is not to be sealed. But when Daniel was given a vision 1,500 years or whatever earlier, he was told to seal up the visions and the dreams that he'd been given because it was for the time of the end. Let's go to Daniel, chapter 12, verse 9. I think it's worth reading it because it helps us introduce ourselves to the book of Revelation. Now, you and I have never had the time, matter, space torn apart and seen the heavenly. Um, that's a privilege of very, very few. Um, Daniel chapter 12, verse 9. He said, go your way, Daniel, because Daniel says, what's the meaning of all this? He wrote it all down. Go your way, Daniel, Daniel 12, 9, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Written for thousands of years, but sealed up until the time of the end. And when we get to Revelation, don't seal it up. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. Hold that thought in your head. Because Revelation talks about the righteous and the pure and the wicked and the horrible. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white, 
Revelation has saints, people redeemed, dressed in white, and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And 2,000 years ago, the book of Revelation was unveiled. It was given and unveiled. For Daniel, in verse 13, Go your way till the end, and you shall rest and stand in your lot of days at the end of days. So Daniel wasn't going to see all this happen. He wasn't even to know some of the things that he saw. Now, Daniel could interpret the vision of the golden head, the chest of silver, the belly of bronze, the iron legs, the feet of iron and clay, representing the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire with the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay, like the United Nations we have today, strong nations and weak nations. And so as we dive into Revelation, turn to chapter 1. I'm going to introduce it right from the very beginning, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's where it came from. Which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Now, we're starting to wonder who the audience is, but let's continue. He made it known by sending his angel, his messenger, to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. So there's an invitation and a blessing to read Revelation. And blessed are those who hear, because you can read but not hear what it says. So many times the scripture says in Revelation to the churches, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So you read, there's a blessing for those who read aloud, a blessing for those who hear, and those who keep what is written in it. So you read it, you hear it, and you keep it in your heart and it changes your worldview, it changes your narrative, for the time is near. And I've been born in a time of messianic expectation. Now who were the audience? It's always nice to know who the author is, where it came from, and who the audience was. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. This is a letter to the church. It was directed to the church's seven churches. Interesting, seven is a, is a number of completion or perfection. The complete church, all the church, and all the characteristics of the church. Grace to you and peace from him who is and was and is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Some translations put it the sevenfold spirits before the throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and ruler of the kings of the earth. Now speaking of Jesus, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, that's at the centre of the gospel message. That's at the centre of the message to the churches. And has made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In verse 7, we are taken to the prophecy given by Jesus in the book of Acts, or the angels, as Jesus ascended to heaven. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Don't listen to those people who tell us that Jesus has already returned. And this is the age of the church, growing the kingdom of God into the millennium. Great revival. No, Jesus hasn't returned yet. Even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail, on account of him. Another translation, so they will mourn. The world will not be happy about Jesus coming back. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, let's continue in verse 9. John, he introduced himself, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that is in Jesus was on the Isle of Patmos, on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. There's a little bit of secular history about how John ended up there, but the Caesar didn't know what to do with him, so they exiled him. And they exiled him where far away he could be, away from the, the centre of Jerusalem, away from Ephesus. He was away from pastoral duties, and that's where God, Jesus Christ met him. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet, so in spirit, he was on the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is at the end of human history and the exchange between when the man civilizations become the realm of Christ's reign. And he says, this is what he says, write what you see in a book 
and send it to the seven churches. This is for the church. It was for the church, the complete church, 2,000 years ago, and it's for the church today. And he goes, Ephesus and Smyrga and Pergamum and Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And from verse 12 to verse 16, you have a vivid description of the glorified Jesus. And John describes him. And in verse 16, from his mouth came a two-edged sword. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. Very symbolic, very powerful. And John collapses as you read in verse 17. But then this Jesus comes and touches him, just like it happened with Ezekiel and Isaiah and others. Because when you time, matter and space is torn open and you are privileged to see the transcendent, you can't cope with it. We are largely shielded from it. I still have a heart. Lord, I want to see you. Now Moses said, I want to see you face by face. And Jesus said, the Lord said, to see me is to die. You can't in the flesh see me, but I give you a glimpse of my glory. And Jesus says, fear not, for I am the first and the last and the living one. I died. There's no question who the voice is here. And I behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. And so he says in verse 19, write therefore the things that you've seen, the things that are, and those that will take place after this. So it was relevant to the first century church, but there's also futuristic. 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the seven messengers of the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Many times you'll have descriptions. You'll see the vision, the symbol and a description. The redeemed from the earth wearing ripe white robes are now dressed in righteousness. They've been forgiven of their sin. Ah, that's what white robes mean. Now, in the, in the Spanish Latin American culture, when someone gets baptised, everybody, as Sister Raquel and Arley would know, and, and yourself, Ivan, they're all dressed in white robes. Now, we don't in our custom. We could well do, because symbolism is very powerful. We use oil when we anoint people as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. To be dressed in white is very powerful. When a bride gets married, what does she dress in? White, a symbol of purity, etc. Now, Many times when I'm telling a story about something I know, people don't like, and off of my family at least, they don't like spoiler alerts. Dad, don't tell us the end of the movie, especially if I've read the book, etc. Um, do you know what a spoiler alert is? Well, I think a spoiler alert is very important to understand the book of Revelation. And one way of doing that is to going from chapter 1 and jumping to chapter 22. Because otherwise, if you're not in chapter 1 and chapter 22, the rest of it is like a little bit enigmatic, a little bit like, whoa, how does all this fit in? I, I call this, your life is like a movie. And you are told the end of the story, that Jesus will call your name from the grave. And I want to live this life with the promise and reward of how the movie ends. So you don't have to participate in the movie of life without knowing how it ends. And so this is a good spoiler alert. We do live happily ever after. Now, I have a problem. I can't watch movies because I get too anxious. And if I know it ends happily ever after, even in a child-friendly movie, I might be tempted to sit down on a Saturday night and watch it, but I won't because if I know there's too much drama, I'll wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning thinking about it. But we're going to go to the end of the book because Jesus, in fact, invites us there. It's an essential key to understanding. Um, one of the things that Jesus said of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit will tell us of things to come. Don't turn there. You can if you want to. John 16, Jesus says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So whatever he hears from Jesus, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. So there's ongoing revelation, even for us today. The Holy Spirit will, de will declare things to come. So you, we can be like the sons of Issachar in the book of Chronicles. They understood the times in which they lived and they knew what to do. There's nothing else being without a GPS in a big city and not knowing where to go and going around in circles. But the word of God will guide us and counsel us. And this is where it's important. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So number one, this is written to the church. It's not written to the government of the day, it's written to the church. Let's go to Revelation 22 beginning in verse 6. 
And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. We've just covered almost full 21 chapters. A massive text that was given to John. And he says, these are trustworthy and true. Why would he say that? An affirmation as to all of it. The parts that we understand easily and the parts that we don't understand at all. They're all true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And brothers and sisters, none of us have a question as we may be the generation on the cusp of seeing that occur. And behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy. To read it, to hear it, and to keep it. Wow. I, John, in verse 8, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me. There was John, so overwhelmed that he did obeisance before the angelic messenger. And he said to me, you must not do that. See, even John, entrusted with this message, got it wrong. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. There's an emphasis on the church to keep holding your heart to hear, worship God. And he says to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy for the time is near. No longer needs to be encrypted for more thousands of years. Then he says, and I've always found this very interesting until I read Daniel, let the evildoers still do evil and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. In other words, we are living in an age where there's some despicable, filthy, wicked people. But we also live in an age of good, kind, caring, compassionate people. And I pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, from the Lord's prayer, so God can protect us from the despicably malevolent wicked that sometimes exists in this world. Verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he he has done. We are given the free gift of eternal life. We can't buy that. But our reward beyond the free gift of eternal life is commensurate with the talents that we've developed and grown. To whom much is required, much is given, much is required. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. When I read the book of Hebrews that's saying, and John and Colossians, where all things were created through Jesus. In the book of Hebrews, he sustains everything by the word of his power, that he's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And where two or three are gathered, there Jesus is among us. His spirit is with us and in us. And I'm thinking, wow. And then he tells us, as flesh counts for nothing, it's the spirit that matters. Then he goes on to say, the blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have a right to the tree of life. Do you know when we see the tree of life first of all? We see it in the book of Genesis, right in the Garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve took up the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life was barred from humanity. But you'll see as you read Revelation 21, the tree of life is available, free, for the healing of the nations, the Holy Spirit at work. Blessed are those who wash their robes. How do we wash our robes? White as clean in the blood of Jesus, his sacrifice so that they may have right to the tree of life, that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside this, beyond this, are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, murderers and idolatries, and everyone who practices and loves falsehood. The second death is coming for them. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Why would Jesus say, I am the root and descendant of David? Well, he is the Son of Man, the promised Messiah, the one who's going to sit on David's throne forever and ever, the bright morning spy. I love the invitation in verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. Let the one who hears, come. So even those of us who hear are brought into this come, this sense of overwhelming invitation. And let the one who's thirsty, come. Come. Let him who, the one who desires the water of life, take without price. Now, this idea of come is very powerful. Jesus says, if anyone, let all you who are weary and burdened, let him 
come to me and I will give him rest. On the last day of the feast in Jerusalem, Jesus said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. To the religious leaders of the day, Jesus says, You refuse to come to me that you may have life. And here in Revelation, we hear this invitation come mentioned three times. Even those who hear, not only Jesus' invitation, not only the Spirit's invitation, but the Spirit and the Bride. The Spirit and the fullness of Jesus and the Bride is the church. If you study Revelation elsewhere, the woman, the Bride, refers to the church. Come. It's a beautiful invitation. It's a powerful, it's a, it's, I'm glad it exists in the end of Revelation, but there's a warning. Revelation is complete. Don't take away from it. Don't add to it. Verse 18. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. I haven't talked about the plagues today. That's a sermon for another day. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, minimalizes it, marginalizes it, doesn't even read it or teach it at all. God will take away his share on the tree of life in the holy city, which is described in this book. In other words, teach what is there. Don't add options in the text that's not there. And don't minimise those parts that we don't understand. We will understand when they happen, as they happen. Revelation is complete. And the more you study it, the more they're complete. The number seven appears many times. That's the only new numerology I'll visit today, because there's plenty of others. It appears many times in Revelation. There are seven churches. There are seven plagues. There are seven angels. There are seven lampstands. There are seven spirits of God. There are seven seals. There are seven horns. There are seven eyes. The seven thunders that spoke, John was told not to write what they had down. There are 7,000 people killed. There are seven heads, seven diadems, which are small crowns, seven kings. Then when you look at word usage, blessing is mentioned seven times in Revelation. Christ is mentioned seven times. Jesus is mentioned 14 times. And I'm going, really? Is that intentional? The lamb is mentioned 28 times. Four groups of seven. And, you know... Um, the world, people, languages, tribes and ethnic, ethnic groups are mentioned um, seven times and the spirit is mentioned 14 times. So the number seven is a numeric, as a complete. In other words, reaffirming, reaffirming, don't add to it, don't take away from it, especially if you don't understand it. In fact, the spirit that inspired this text, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, is the same spirit that will illuminate it for us. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's written seven times in the book of um, Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3 to those seven churches. You know, Jesus is coming. Brothers and sisters, he's coming as Lord. He's coming as King of Kings. He's coming in the, in the power and the image and the blessing of his Father. And you and I go back to the parables of Jesus to something a bit lighter than Revelation, we tell parables a certain nobleman in Luke went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he's talking about himself. And in the parable of the ten maidens and the, and the groom coming, the idea is the wedding supper's coming, the bride is there waiting, but the groom is taking ages. And at midnight, everyone's fallen asleep. So half the maidens say, oh, our lamp has run out of oil. Oil is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. They were all asleep. And the surprise nature of Jesus' coming is mentioned right through his parables. And the question that we have to ask, are we asleep? Are we awake? Are we reading, hearing, keeping? In other words, are we full of the Holy Spirit? It's a warning. It's, it's, it's the surprise factor in Jesus' return is there. So the takeaway, what's the takeaway for us? in this short sermon. I can't read all of Revelation and I'm not going to even try to. But what I can do is to go Revelation 1.3. We start it there and we'll finish there. Blessed are those who read aloud the words of this prophecy. In other words, have the Bible next to your bed on the dinner table and especially as you come to Revelation against all the scriptures that you've read before, blessed are those who hear. He that has an ear, 
Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches and keep what is written, for the time is near. In other words, there's no excuse for being knocking at the door and saying, Lord, Lord, let me in. And he says, I never knew you. The door is closed. It's too late. In other words, there is a blessing and an encouragement. And Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, he will declare to you things that are yet to come. And may we be wise and enlivened in the Spirit, awake. The book of Revelation speaks to us. And uh, I pray the day when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is sooner than later. At the end of Revelation, let me turn there, right at the very end, chapter 22, the very last verse. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Another translation says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen, come Lord Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew, If the days had not been cut short, all of human flesh would have perished. But Jesus is coming. And then John says, Amen, come Lord Jesus.